I, Pete wasn't my favorite player. Joe, Cesar Geronimo was my favorite player on that big red machine because he was a left-handed center fielder. Uh, Pete was great. He was cocky. You know, I always thought he was a little brash. I know why people used to boo him on the, on the road. Uh, and Joe was, you know, we all did the flap thing, I think, in Little League, whatever. And, uh, and actually, I was a big Lee May guy as well before they traded him and uh, the Big Red Machine kind of took over. But, um, you know, it, it, having Pete Rose be the guy to run your ball club and you're in Cincinnati, I mean, I couldn't think of a better scenario. Um, he was great. Uh, he'd, he'd, all he asked you to do was show up on time and play hard. You know, I don't think he expected everybody to sprint down to first base when they walked like he did. Uh, although there was a couple guys that did. Tracy Jones was one of them and uh, a couple other guys. But uh, anyway, uh, the cool thing was Tony Perez was there. I mean, I played with Tony Perez, Dave Concepcion, Ken Griffey, and Pete Rose, part of the Big Red Machine. So I was kind of uh, very fortunate to be connected to both of them, uh, both generations, the Big Red Machine and, and the 1990 Little Red Wagon we had, so. Um, but well, again, we, uh, we won the World Series. But I mean, that's, the cool thing was like rain delays or anytime we had some time off, we used to sit around Tony and, and Davey and try to understand what they were saying. But, uh, you know, and Pete uh, talk about the stories of the Big Red Machine, you know, because it was, I think it was, we all idolized that team, at least the, the Reds fans that I know. Uh, so it was kind of neat to be in the inside and hearing those stories. And, and I have since been able to do some functions with Joe Morgan, uh, Johnny Bench. Johnny Bench calls me perfect. He sent me a text, and I would never ever had to get a text from Johnny Bench. I didn't know he had my number. And all of a sudden, I get a text one day. He goes, hey, perfect. This is five. <laughs> so I said, can I put you in my phone book as five? And uh, so I have him. I have Joe Morgan, number eight. And... Uh, but just getting to be around those guys and how professional they were and how just the things that they did, uh, you know, that were so, uh, that had such a big influence on me as a kid. Uh, and then when I got to be an adult and uh, got to hang, hang with them, uh, it made it even better. But I, I saw my first Major League Baseball game. I moved from Casper, Wyoming to upstate New York when I was in high school. And that was a culture shock because in Wyoming, we're not in a hurry to do anything. Out in New York, it just and I was up upstate New York, and it still was fast paced. And uh, but anyway, I, I was up near the Canadian border for my junior and senior year, and my best friend up there, we went up and scalped a couple tickets to see the Reds play the uh, Expos. And it was, Pete Rose was in the middle of his hitting streak, I think 36, 37, I don't remember exactly which one. Uh, but we scalped tickets, and we got in there, and by uh, and it was Tom Seaver against Steve Rogers. And Pete Rose scored the winning run in the 14th inning on a sack fly by Joe Morgan. And uh, by the time, by the end of the game, we had worked our way down to the dugout uh, in Montreal at Olympic Stadium, wherever they call it. I didn't like pitching there. But anyway, we, uh, I, we were looking into the dugout, and Pete Rose is drinking an orange crush. I said, nice game, Mr. Rose. He said, thanks, fellas. And then seven years later, I was in there with Pete Rose, and I told him the story. And I said, I was here seven years ago when you guys were, you know, and I told them a story, whatever, so, uh, which was really cool. Uh, but I couldn't have uh, asked for a better career. You know, I, I got, like I said, I played 12 years. I spent 11 years here in Cincinnati. Uh, I got hurt the last three or four years. I signed a long-term deal and I got hurt every year of that deal. Okay, so I was stealing money, I suppose. But um, I couldn't ask to be on a, on, a, on a better team, a better organization. Like I said, I got part of the Big Red Machine. Davey Concepcion, one of my dear friends, he didn't like too many guys to put on his glove, but he used to let me put my hand in his glove because when you put your hand in Davey Concepcion's glove, your hand says, this is where I belong. I mean, it just felt so cool to have that. And I, he was right-handed, so I certainly had to break mine in myself. But uh, just all the things that those guys incorporated, you know, when then Lou Pinella came in, you know, when Pete was asked to get out of baseball, um, and Lou Pinella came in, uh, he was kind of, he, he had, I remember the first meeting we had, he said that there was too much talent in this, in this clubhouse not to have won up to this point. He said, is it, so this is our year. And his second statement was, and I'm here to win, so I don't care if you like me. And then we, and we walked out and we went uh, started spring training. Uh, 
And our first, in, in spring training, we do these things called cutoffs and relays, where you try to line up your shortstop and second baseman on throws to third, whatever else. You know, very, very basic. We do it, every, you know, every spring, along with pitchers fielding practice. But we, the very first play of the very first uh, cutoffs and relays, we screwed it up, and Lou Pinella went off. I mean, very, I mean, it's like, whoa. And, uh, but he just lets you know how serious he was. But he was a... Uh, Awesome guy to play for. We, we that was the year we started the season on the road in Houston. Uh, we won our first nine uh, and, and went wire to wire. Uh, but a dream year that went by really, really fast. The World Series. The pressure for us was really in the playoffs uh, because whoever wins the playoffs is going to the World Series. So uh, the Pittsburgh series for us was our was where the the. Uh, uh, the intensity was. But once we got there, uh, we we're in the World Series, now we had to face the mighty Oakland A's. And I was at, uh, when, they first, when they came into town to start the World Series, I went out there to watch them take batting practice. And in my career, I think I've seen three balls hit in the red seats. I think everybody on that team hit three balls in the red seats. <laughs> I was up watching Conseco, McGuire, Harold Baines. Uh, I said, oh my God, they were, Powerful, but good pitching beats good hitting every time. So, and, and we had a we had the hottest pitcher in baseball, Jose Rijo. Uh, we had the nasty boys in the bullpen. So all we needed to do was get a lead going into the seventh, and that game was pretty much ours most of the time. So, uh, Eric Davis set the tone. The very first uh, first inning, hit that bullet into center field, almost knocked that camera guy out in center field, and uh, we never looked back. Uh, and to this day, we have a nine-game winning streak in the World Series. We haven't lost since game six and uh, since 75. And some people said we still lost it because Carlton Fisk hit the home run and, uh, or, or that uh, Boston won that series three games to four. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I winded up my career. I started, you know, when you get older, things start slowing down. Things don't work like they used to. Uh, I hung on there. I mean, I ended up breaking my arm in 94, trying to come back uh, from that. Cause Mentally, I was not ready to quit playing baseball, but my body was tore up, and it was. So, uh, 96 spring training, I ended up going to Kansas City uh, and retiring that spring. I got married on uh, March 24th, 1984, and I retired on March 24th, uh, 1996. It's a really bad day. <laughs> Actually, I've been married for 35 years, so uh, I've got five kids, and seven grandkids, uh, so I'm staying busy. But uh, when I retired, I went to the golf course for a little bit. Uh, I had to do something, you know. My wife didn't want me hanging around the house, so I had to find stuff to do. So I ended up going to play golf and uh, started competing in golf. And then the Florence Freedom came along. They asked me if I would consider running that team, and I did uh, for a year and a half. Uh, and it's it, what it is, it's an independent league professional baseball. Uh, these kids don't make a ton. I think they make maybe a thousand bucks a month now, but it's only for five months. Um, but it's they're, they're kids that are still trying to chase that dream. And there's been a few guys that have, have come out of independent league ball and actually got to the major leagues. And uh, but most of those kids there will show you why they're there. And but if you you know they're a little bit short somewhere, uh, but if they're able to polish it and get it signed by an affiliate team, a lot of them, like I said, get the opportunity. So. But that was my first uh, stint in coaching. I managed him. Uh, I had Chris Hook, who's now the pitching coach for Milwaukee, uh, as my pitching coach. I had a guy named Donnie Robinson, a very dear friend of mine, played for the Pirates and the Giants and the Phillies. And I had him as my third base coach. And we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. We just didn't play very well. But uh, that came to an end. And then it, it just so happened that the Castellanis bought the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, from Carl Linder, uh, and the first thing they did is they called a bunch of us former players and got us back involved. We were just like guest coaches and stuff, going down instructional league and even spring training, and then finally they asked me if I'd want to uh, get into coaching full time, and I did. I, I went to Billings, Montana, a couple times. I was in Sarasota uh, for one year, Arizona for five. I was in Dayton for a couple years. I was in Bakersfield, California, for a year. Louisville. Uh, Zebulon, North Carolina, uh, but I spent most of my time at the lower levels, rookie ball uh, especially. You know, we'd have the draft, 
Uh, we bring all them kids in from the draft for a little, what they call a mini camp before we send them to Billings or keep them there in Arizona. And uh, I would give them the big spiel on being a professional. What do we expect out of you as a pitcher? You know, putting a ball in your hand every day, kind of, just the kind of things we expected. And I said, you all should expect to get your butts kicked too, because it's going to happen. I said, how you handle it is really going to make the difference. So. Uh, but then I'd walk away from it, and then they would come up to me and say, well, did you play in the major league? And I said, yeah, I sure did. And then they'd go home and look me up and come and tell me about all the things I did. <laughs> you used to wear red underwear when you pitched. I said, well, they weren't really underwear, but they were, you know, under shorts. Uh, but this guy, this company came in, and they had, they had a, a pair of white ones and a pair of green ones and a bunch of just uh, a red one and a green one and then a bunch of white ones. And I took the red and the green. Uh, and I wore the red ones on game day. I called it game day. Uh, red drawer day is what we called it, so. And it, they are hanging up in the Reds clubhouse to this day, so. Uh, Rick Stowe's found a reason to keep them, so. Uh, but anyway, I, I did write a book, uh, a guy named Dan Stupp, who used to be uh, with the Reds. Uh, I sat down with him for like four, maybe five months, and we kind of, uh, there's been some books written before, Tales from the Dugout with Cardinals, Bob Forrest did it, I think Ron Kittle did it for the White Sox. And they came to us and asked us to do it. So I read their books uh, just to kind of get a feel. And, and I wanted to do it differently anyway. I wanted to do it chronologically. I wanted to start when the Reds came into my life and I was a bowler like I was down in Wyoming. Uh, just kind of worked my way all the way through. Uh, and through different publishing companies, it's had three different prints and three different companies. I've always added a chapter and, uh, at the end. Uh, but it was kind of a neat thing to, to do. I, there was a lot of things that uh, my memory was uh, not correct <laughs> on some things, but, but I got it validated by some of the statistics and stuff like that, you know. Uh, the perfect game, uh, obviously my, my greatest individual feat, uh, but I couldn't have done it without my teammates. So the World Series and being elected into their Hall of Fame are probably the two greatest accomplishments I, I ever could expect, you know. And I owe everything to the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, they has opened some doors for me here. It's kept me around. Uh, the fact that I'm the only guy to throw a perfect game for the Reds, I'm very, very proud of that. I don't expect it to last, uh, but I'm okay if it lasts until I leave this earth. <laughs> uh, but I think with the, uh, the way the pitching's going now, we got some kids we got coming up uh, that, that maybe, maybe not. I mean, like I said, I'm okay with that. But uh, the Hall of Fame induction in 2006, was kind of special for me because my mom has, uh, was battling uh, small cell lung cancer, which is like a 5% survival rate, and she is in that 5%. So uh, she's still with us today, but she had just got done with her chemo, and uh, she wasn't totally healthy, but she was healthy enough to travel, and she came with my brother, and uh, she still had more hair than me. And, <laughs> but uh, it was kind of special to have her there. Uh, I was very nervous with my, very nervous with my mom being there, but uh, it was certainly a special event for me. And, and I was getting a little long-winded during my speech, and Tony Perez started barking at me. I said, "Okay, if Doggy says I'm done. I'm done." So, uh, but the coaching part for me was was just as enjoyable as as as, uh, as playing. You know, because I got to help kids, and maybe not a lot. I mean, when I first started coaching, I thought I was going to get every one of those guys the big leagues. And what ended, up, what ended up happening is they taught me how to be a good coach. You know, I, you know, I just, I, I didn't want anybody to throw like me. I, did, I wanted everybody to approach the game like me, but that doesn't mean it happened. Uh, because I was taught by some good guys. I mean, some good, some good teachers, some good coaches, you know, and, and I always emphasize anything that comes out of my mouth came out of somebody else's mouth first. I didn't invent anything. You know, I learned what worked for me, and I stayed within those guidelines. When I strayed from that, then it usually didn't work out so well. So, but getting uh, these young kids to kind of, one, I need them to be cocky. I need them to be very confident guys, but I don't want you to tell anybody. I said, I want you to be the cockiest guy out there, but I need you to keep it to yourself. Because you know, uh, confidence will be wavering. They're going to struggle with that confidence thing. And if you have to understand that sometimes you go out there and you just suck. You just have bad days. You know, it has to, it's part of the, part of the, the game. You know, you can't be great all the time. Uh, you just try to be accountable, reliable, and give me your best effort every time out there. You know, leave it all out there. 
Uh, and when these kids understand that, and it's funny how they just kind of start working their way up. So, uh, but I've had, you know, I had Amir Garrett, Wandy Peralta, Tyler Molly, uh, Robert Stevenson. I had all those guys at one time, and I didn't screw them up. They made it anyway. So, uh, but like I said, I learned a lot from coaching. I learned, and Lou Pinella probably was one guy that I tried to idolize or uh, uh, coach like, just because he was so awesome at handling players and people and. Uh, he made it fun, and, and he, but he always also held you accountable. You know, in today's game, these guys, you know, it's a little different. You know, making a lot of money, uh, you can hit 30 home runs, strike out 200 times, drive in 60 runs, you had a great year. You know, and it's, what'd you do with them other 500 at bats, you know? Um, but it's, I mean, again, it's, it's stat oriented. It's, it's driven now by analytics. Uh, some of it has purpose. I don't think it, it should have as big a purpose as it's getting. Uh, because you're dealing, dealing with the human element, you're dealing with heart, you're dealing with uh, you know, desire, and, uh, and that's hard to put a, put a number kind of thing on that. So, uh, But I like this team here. You know, we're struggling a little bit. I don't know what the hell happened yesterday, how that got away from us. Uh, but it just happens, you know. We haven't really learned to finish off, because we took a what, seven nothing lead. You know, I was with my grandkids and I kind of got away and I came back and I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, and then we made a valiant effort at the, at the, the last, but uh, you know, we're, 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 we can compete with all these teams in our division. We're just as good as they are. Uh, we just haven't uh, run off on a streak yet. We haven't got super hot and you know, we may never get hot, but I still think there's a streak coming. You know, I think we're gonna win today and, and hopefully win the next nine after that. So I wanna, I wanna win 10 in a row and see what happens and see where we stand, you know. Is that asking for a lot? You bet it is, but I want to see it, so. Uh, as I am, I bleed Cincinnati Red. I, I love everything about these guys. This is a good clubhouse. Uh, the pitching, starting pitching, gosh, we just need to get deeper. We just blow, burn it up our bullpen, so. Uh, or just let him stay out there. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Something happened to Tyler or something or whatever. I know he, I saw him limping or something after he gave up the, the first couple runs, but. Who's to say? But anyway, uh, I do. I now, I now kind of travel around Cincinnati and the greater Cincinnati area, and uh, you know, do some things like this, which I enjoy doing. I love talking to Reds fans. Uh, I did buy a bar over in Newport, by the way. Uh, it's called Brownings on York. It's right there on uh, right across that Southgate Bridge. Uh, my wife runs it now, so I'm just a yes man. <laughs> I have to do everything. I, but I love it. I, I enjoy it. It's you walk out my door, you can see Great American right there. It's within walking distance. Uh, it's a nice, it's, it's a kind of neighborhood bar. It's not a huge bar. Uh, but it's an endeavor I've always wanted, uh, wanted to do, and I'm now doing it, and now I'm trying to think why I even tried to do it. So, uh, But it's a lot of fun. you got to be there every day. got to pay attention, you know. I have a 100-year-old building, so I have a 100-year-old plumbing and wiring, and uh, I don't know if they, that's mice or something. I chewed up some of it, but it's... Uh, we're doing some, we're making some changes, so, but it's been a lot of fun doing that and, and still being involved with the Reds. I mean, I can't thank them enough. They, they give me a lot of opportunities uh, to do some things. I got to rappel down a building for Aubrey Rose Foundation. Whew. Uh, I did it last year, and I couldn't stop shaking for a half an hour when I got to the ground. I mean, such an adrenaline rush. Uh, this time, it was a little bit more relaxed. I still had to go down, and then I still had that little shake thing when I got there, but it was, uh, it was pretty cool. It was really neat to uh, to repel. Uh, so I, I stay involved. I, I you know I do some I throw some batting practice and stuff still. So uh, I'm just I like to stay involved. I got six grandkids that I'm raising, uh, so they take up a lot of my time uh, and energy, <laughs> money. <laughs> uh, but they're wonderful. Uh, and again, it's just that it's, I enjoy doing what I do and I, I try to stay busy. So uh, with that, and I'll turn it over to some questions. If you guys got any questions about some things, I certainly have a lot of opinions. I don't really voice them very often because uh, I don't know if they did carry any weight. But uh, I do like this, this team. Uh, I'd like to see them kind of get going a little bit. Uh, you know, we had to go to Colorado after, after the All-Star break. And you, that's not even real baseball out there. Okay, because the, the, the field is so big that they got to play so deep that the guy can hit a base hit and the guy can almost score from first base. 
because the air is so thin. And balls that, you know, opposite field fly balls usually have that tail to it. Not out there. It stays straight as a string. So you're hoping something bends foul? No, it lands in the seat. So, I mean, I, that's just a terrible place to get started for the second half. And unfortunately, we, we have been uh, cursed with our, our schedule this year. Our April schedule was terrible. Our September schedule is going to be terrible. Uh, so we got to find a way to, to play through that as well. So with that, uh, I'll take some questions or whatever you like. Anybody got any questions? And I'm going to uh, sit down now. I was just wondering about um, when you were growing up, did your fam was your family like a baseball family or was it an individual seed that you kind of oh. gave you? Well, my parents got divorced because my dad was a sports jock. He was a sports bum, what my mom called it. Because uh, he, he played basketball in the winter. They played, I grew up watching fast pitch softball. Uh, and that's where I learned to work quick. But no, we weren't even allowed to wear, watch sports on TV in my house. My mom forbid that. You're not going to grow up and be a sportsman like your dad. <laughs> well, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, no, but we were always outside. You can just leave. You know, go outside, play. Find something to do outside. We'd shovel the driveway to, during the wintertime and play basketball. Uh, or we'd play in the vacant. We broke every window in that neighborhood with playing basketball or playing baseball. And uh, We used to have a, and I'm sure everybody did back then, when you, you don't have enough players, well, right field is an automatic out, so you don't hit it to right field. If you hit it anywhere else, you, you get a play. So uh, we found a way to stay busy. We didn't have uh, Fortnite or anything like that. So. Uh, but no, we weren't allowed to watch too many sports. And I, I actually told my mom I was going to play for the Cincinnati Reds, and she told me I was dreaming. So, uh, but I think that was, you know, when I was 10 or 11 years old, I said that. So, but I was saying it when I was in high school too. <laughs> well, but no, not too many sports allowed. Yes, yes, ma'am. Question: uh, What would you have done differently in last night's game as far as the pitching? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. Personally, if I may, like I said, I think we need to lean on these starters more. You know, we're at the age now where they don't like him pitching to the third time through the lineup kind of thing. You know, and when I was coaching, I said I'm trying to teach these guys how to get through that lineup three times, uh, and now all of a sudden they don't want to have to get through the, you know, which is why they have an eight-man bullpen. Uh, but. Personally, on the, on last night, I, I don't know what happened with Tyler because I saw him limping. They came out and they took him out of the game. Uh, I would, you know, in, I would, I would, if he wasn't hurt or in anything like that, I would have left him out there. I, I mean, these guys, I, I need my starters to to get through that sixth inning with with jams or tough situations or and even sometimes a seventh. Because uh, I can promise you that bullpen don't, doesn't mind having days off, you know. And uh, the, the complete game kind of thing, I think the pitch count's a little misused, you know. Uh, there's certain guys that can probably throw, like Johnny Cueto when he was here. He could throw 120 pitches a game. You know, Bronson Arroyo, uh, Homer Bailey. Those guys were horses, and they could take you deep into the game. You know, and, he, and like I said, and you get in those situations in the sixth and, and sometimes the seventh, you've got to allow them to get themselves out of that. they got to learn to be able to do that because we can't. I mean, when you go to the playoffs, then you can dick around with that rotation or the starting whatever you want to do. You want to only let them go four or five or whatever else. Uh, but to get to the playoffs, you've got to have your horses carry it deep into the, deeper into the game. And I would like to see them. And then... You know, to David's defense and, and uh, DJ's defense, um, they that you can also say, well, they needed to come out. You know, but I'm I'm just thinking that maybe you know, my, and this is just like I said, my my personal opinion. I just wish that they would allow them to maybe try and get themselves out of those situations more often, instead of running to the bullpen. And and running to the bullpen is not a bad thing. It's just that, like I said. Eventually you're going to overexpose them and they're going to have to pitch three out of four days and that kind of thing, and it just makes it tough. What do you think of the manager? To me, he's made some dumb... <laughs> I mean, that's my opinion, and I've followed him for over 50 years. Yeah, well, I mean, this is David's first year. They need... Uh, um, they need... They need Barry Larkin. <laughs> I mean, that's 
Oh, well. They're both molar guys, I can say that. No, no, I'll, like I said, I, I, this is David's first year. I love David. I coached with him in minor leagues. I knew him when he was a kid because I played with his dad. Uh, yeah, but I think David has done all the things necessary to become a well-rounded baseball person. Is it managing? I like, personally, I like him. Uh, you know, we've had some situations. I mean, yes, there's some games that have gotten away from us. Uh, but I, I can't really blame David, you know. I mean, he might have made a couple mistakes as far as moves or something. But, again, I, I think too much of him and his baseball knowledge to uh, – uh, I'll put it to you this way. If you want to be a good manager, you need good players. You want to be a good pitching coach, you need good pitchers. You know, and they, they will make us look good or they will make us look bad. Uh, we don't really have a whole lot of influence on – the outcome of the game, other than trying to put ourselves in those situations where we can be successful more often than not. Uh, again, the human element comes into play. Uh, I don't see command of the strike zone like I used to see it. It's just everybody's throwing hard now and they want to pitch up. And, you know, I think, like I said, the analytics has come in and it flooded the market that we really don't even know what we're reading at half the time and what, the, you know, this guy hits the ball over here. Well, what was that pitch and why did he hit it over there? You know, was it a breaking ball that he sat back on? Because if he did, then he's a bowling ball inside on a fastball. I mean, all those things can come into play, but, you know, they are doing, they're punching a bunch of numbers in a computer and figure and, and getting uh, data spit out that may or may not have uh, merit. You know, I, I just think that when you've got all that information and you're not sure exactly what it all means, and you try to jam it into some way fitting your system, I think it's tough. Uh, and I don't know anything from anything. I don't know what kind of data they're getting. I've never asked. Uh, I've talked about some things that went on there, but uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, the one thing about David, you know, he, he's a, he's got his players back. He will argue. I, you know, I, I thought it was going to be tough for him to get thrown out of these games, but hell, he made it easy. Uh, but again, I think, you know, being a first year guy, I think he's learning. Uh, but we haven't played as consistent. We haven't, you know, we've had some pitchers that have had some decent stints. Uh, and if it wasn't for the pitching, we'd be really, really bad. Uh, and our pitching has kept us in there. We just haven't figured out a way to close them games out, to come back and win those games uh, like last night. It would have been nice. Joey hit a bullet down the right field. We win the game. Uh, instead, the guy, he snared it at first base, and we lose the game. Uh, but we have played in a lot of one-run games and we've lost a lot of one-run games. You know, what we need to do is learn how to win those one-run games. Do the little things that help and uh, I like David. I, 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 I'm willing to give him, a, you know, give him a pass right now because I think, you know, these guys like playing for him and that, that means a lot, uh, but we'll see. Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Hi. Um, I was wondering who is the toughest batter you faced and who is the toughest batter you've seen on the Reds? Kind on the on toughest, first one and the second one was what? The toughest batter you have faced as a pitcher, and who is the toughest batter you've seen hit as a Red? Who's the best Reds hitter? Okay, that's easy. Uh, well, I had a guy named Bobby Bonilla when he played for the Pirates. I think he's still getting paid. He gets a million dollars every June. Uh, what a great deal. Uh, uh, I love pitching up and in. I like pitching low and away and up and in. Those are my two spots. I could throw them there in my sleep. I kept trying to get Bobby Bonilla out up and in. He kept hitting home runs, and it pissed me off. I, said, you know, I might have finally got him out up and in, but I had to go somewhere else. Uh, he, he, he hit me well. I mean, Barry Bonds was a good player. I think he got maybe five or six home runs off me. Uh, but there was a guy named Tim Tuffle. Played for the Mets, played for the Padres. He had a rocket off me every time. I, I finally, after we were done playing, I saw him. I said, hey, how come you hit me so well? He said, well, I went up there looking fastball. And I said, well, that's all I threw you. He said, that's why I hit you so well. <laughs> uh, but there's just certain guys that, uh, you know, whatever, you just kind of fit their mode or they fit yours. Uh, John Shelby, who's from Lexington. I, if I needed a strikeout, I wanted, I could, hopefully John Shelby showed up because I could strike him out a lot. Because uh, I could throw it where he couldn't get, his, get the bat to. Uh, best hitter I ever saw, you know, I'm, I'm a big Cal Daniels guy. I played with Cal in rookie ball, and he led the league in everything. Uh, he got the big leagues, and he just, 
he hit all the good pitchers. Nolan Ryan, Mike Scott. I mean, he used to own them guys. I mean, he'd go up there and hit a home run. And, uh, but he was a good hitter. He just had a pair of bad knees. And we played on AstroTurf. So it really, it really bothered him a lot. Uh, you know, I think Joey, obviously. Peter Edward. You know, no one worth, not even worth mentioning there. He's 4,256 hits. So, uh, But Cal was probably my one I thought was the best, best hitter I ever saw in the Reds organization. Yes, yes, yes. In the in the rain delay during your perfect game, did you have the type of mindset you just wanted to hang out and be by yourself, or did you like hang no, out with the guys? No, I wasn't. Guys? You know, I wasn't uh, that intense. You know, like Danny Jackson, he liked to really kind of stay to himself and focus. And me, I just put a dip of tobacco in and put some country music on and just drank some iced tea, waiting for it to start. So, and I just kind of sat in my in my locker. Uh, I had a uh, like a director's chair that Buddy Bell had that he gave me when he left. So. I usually sat in there and, uh, you know, just kind of, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't keep to myself. I didn't play cards or anything, but I, you know, I used to drink a lot of iced tea on game day because uh, they said it had more caffeine than coffee. And all the other days I drank coffee, but on game day I drank iced tea. But no, I was, I just, uh, you know, game day for me or for anybody that's starting pitcher, that it was their day to choose whatever music they wanted, you know, re hoping on that Spanish stuff. We never had to understood what it said, but, uh, <laughs> You know, but you just count whatever your element was, you know. But I didn't, uh, I was always focused, you know, because that was my one day, you know, where I got to be a player. You know, I had to bat ninth, and all the hitting counts, 3-1, 3-0, 2-0 counts, I got to take, because uh, I wasn't allowed to swing. But that was my one day to be part of the team. So I, I cherished that day uh, more than any other days. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the shift uh, that's being used, that has been used for the last couple of years. How do you see that affecting baseball? Uh, I call it the, uh, the fairness of the game as it progresses. Well, I, I had this conversation with Nikki Crawl. We were on the caravan. I don't know what town we were in, but we were walking to dinner, and I said, let me ask you something, you know, because we'd always have these uh, – these meetings before a team comes into town or the first day a team comes into town we have a pitchers meeting we go over the hitters and all this stuff you know this guy's a first ball fastball hitter this guy's vulnerable to the breaking ball whatever I mean whatever reports we got but it it, it, uh, it shouldn't change my approach you know if that guy's a first ball fastball hitter well I'm a first ball fastball pitcher so it's on I'm, if I make a quality pitch uh, he's probably going to make an out. You know, I don't want to bow down to any hitter. Uh, I don't want to have to, you know, there's certain guys you got to pitch around, yeah. But I, you know, I didn't, every pitch I threw, I tried to throw a strike. But anyway, getting back to this conversation with Nikki, I said, now, are you now asking the pitchers to pitch to the hitter's weakness, or do you want them to stay with their strengths? You know, and to be honest, I don't think, I don't think most of these pitchers know what their strengths are. I don't think they have an approach on how to attack a hitter. I mean, when a hitter stepped in the box on me, I knew what my third pitch was before I threw my first. Because that was my plan of attack, you know. I want to get two away, get his eyes out here, and then come up here and maybe get a pop-up. So, uh, And he said, well, it's a little bit of both. I said, because I can get a right-hand hitter hit a ground ball to my second baseman. I said, if I do that and he's standing behind second base, I'm going to be pissed. You know, it's a, and, and to be honest, uh, they would come and ask me where I want my, my outfielders. I said, I don't care where you put my infielders. You know, I wouldn't have been okay with the big shifts, but uh, but I always wanted my right my outfielders in a certain spot. You know, he would go over hitter by hitter by hitter by hitter. You know, play him opposite field, everything oppo, give him left field line. If he pulls it, it's my fault, but I'm gonna get him to hit it to one of those guys there, that kind of thing. I mean that was my approach. You know, now I think they're they're kind of to be honest, I think they're trying to get these guys to pitch to the hitter's weakness. Because Pitchers don't know the strengths. They're not sure how they plan of attack. I mean, if I were to walk up to one of these guys and say, hey, what, well, how would you throw, give me a three-pitch sequence to anybody, Molina. You know, I don't know if they could tell me that. You know, because the catchers, some of these pitchers are just going to fall along with what the catcher is, you know. Uh, instead, of say, instead of shaking your head, no, I want to throw this, you know, and I tell him, I said, if you shake your guy off because you want to throw a perk, a different pitch, do it with conviction. Don't say, oh, I should have thrown another pitch. If you want to throw that, you throw it, you know, with conviction and trying to get it where you need to get it to. Uh, but like I said, I think command of the strike zone is, is 
very, very, almost non-existent. You know, they're just trying to see how hard they can throw it. They want them to pitch up in the zone now. I said, I pitched up in the zone, but I started down here first. I got their eyes looking down here, and all of a sudden this ball comes, and they can't get to it. You know, but they're going right after him right here right now. So if they bring it down a little bit, it gets mighty whack. So, although I do think the balls are harder, gosh. And the bats are harder for sure. You got this birch now and the maple and all that, just really hard wood. And the balls are jumping. They like it. So, yes. Of the Reds team now, who is your favorite pitcher? <sighs> well, obviously Louis Castillo. I mean, I, Tyler Molly was the favorite. My, 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 the probably Tyler Molly, Amir Garrett, and another kid named T.J. Antone, who's in AAA now, I think. Uh, those three guys were my favorite guys that I coached. Uh, I enjoyed watching them make their ascent to the major leagues. But they were, you know, guys that Amir had to work at it because he was quitting basketball and was kind of dedicating his whole time to uh, baseball. And when he did, he shot through the organization. <laughs> Uh, but Louis Castillo, obviously, you know, the, he's pretty solid. He's really good. He's, he's a young Mario Soto to me because his, his changeup is so devastating. And the thing that I liked is I threw a fastball and a screwball was my changeup. But once those hitters knew I had a screwball or I had a really good changeup like they do with Louis Castillo, suddenly that you can start throwing more fastballs too because they're, they're saying, oh, here comes a changeup and that fastball's on them and they can't do anything with it. So. It's going to be neat to see how he uh, goes from here on out because I think he's going to be a really, really, really good one. So, question for you about uh, Wrigley up in the outfield. How, how did that all come about? And, and Wrigley Field. Tell that oh, story, yes. Well, that was Tony Perez. The year Tony Perez got fired, uh, and we were 25 guys going in 25 different directions. It was just a, uh, you know. It was just not wasn't a very good atmosphere when him because we were so angry, you know. And Davey, you know, he was the guy that came in, but you know, we didn't care. We were still mad because Bowden kind of took Tony away from us. So uh, we go and play in the Pirates and play Pittsburgh. And a guy named Bob Walk uh, got with a ground crew guy out in Chicago, and he took him up into the scoreboard. So I he said, hey, when you get there, go see Terry, ground crew, he'll get you up in the scoreboard. So that's what I did. We went went out to the batting practice the first day, and I and I went down the right field line, and I see Terry and. I get about uh, 10 feet from me, and he starts shaking his head. He said, you want to get in the scoreboard, don't you? I said, I do. He said, well, I can't. I guess he get the brass, sat down, said something about uh, not doing that. And I said, oh, okay. So Timmy Belcher was with us. He was uh, one of the pitchers on that team that year. We went out to the outfield, and we're just sitting there shagging. And I said, hey, what do you think, Belcher? I said, what about one of them buildings over there? I said, I could probably get over in one of them buildings. So. We go in after batting practice, and the clubhouse guy, uh, Tom Hellman, I said, uh, do you know anybody that owns any of them buildings? He said, yeah, his name is George Lucas. He said, not the George Lucas, but a George Lucas. I said, do you have his phone number? He said, yeah. I said, can you get him on the phone for me? So we got him on the phone. I said, George, I'm, my name's Tom Browning. I'm with the Reds. I was hoping maybe I could sneak over and sit on one of your rooftops, maybe half an inning. He said, that would be so cool. Why don't you meet me out in front of Murphy's Pub in the top of the third inning? I said, OK. I said, I'll have a black sweatsuit on. Uh, with my red hat and my red turf shoes. And uh, I said, I'll meet you out there in the third, top of the third inning. So I sat in the bullpen for two innings, because in Wrigley, he, that dugout's not very big. So you want to spread out, you got to get on the bullpen. So I'm sitting in the bullpen for two innings, and after the bottom of the second's over, I stood up and I said, all right, boys, look for me. And they said, where are you going? I said, don't worry, you'll find me. <laughs> so I went in there and I told Belch I'm out of there, and I went upstairs, put the sweatshirt on, I went down to Met Security Guard, uh, which was let you right out there by Murphy's Pub. And I, and I said, I'll be right back. And, and uh, so I met George. We walked down three or four buildings, uh, got up to the top. And back that, at that time in 93, it was, they were all apartments. Uh, so I walked up the stairwell to the third floor, took my sweatsuit off. There was a little bit of, there was a railing there that I sat on with a landing right below me. I was maybe about this far apart, height-wise. So I wasn't on the edge of the building. So if somebody came and shoved me, that kind of thing. Um, and I got up there and I took my hat off and well you saw it, I was waving to those guys and they waved back and uh, by the top of the uh, fourth inning I was back in the dugout. And uh, Belch come over, Timmy Belch said, hey man, I got the TV camera on you. I said, yeah, you just cost me money. <laughs> uh, but it worked out and we had, uh, while I was there, Kevin mentioned a three run homer, uh, we took the lead, we won the ball game, you know, but it didn't sit well with Davey. And I, know, I, don't, I don't think it really bothered Davey too much, it just bothered Bowden. 
It bothered, he thought he wanted to find me for insubordination. And the only thing I did is I left the uniform, left the stadium in my uniform. And that's the only fine I, I got. It was a $500 fine. Uh, so that was about what it, where it ended up. 10 days later, the Florida Marlins just came into the league. Wayne Huizinga, the owner of the Marlins, sends his secretary down to our clubhouse. He wants me to sit in his restaurant in right center field. <laughs> and I said, listen, this, the, the general manager is not a big fan of me, so I think I'm going to have to abstain. He said, although I would, I, I would, I'm almost considering it, but I said, no, I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there. But that's how it came about. You know, I tried to get in the scoreboard. That didn't happen. I improvised. Uh, but I got a nice, well, I called the lady that took the picture. It was in the Sun-Times. The, the photographer. I got her name. I called her. I said, man, I, and I told her who I was. I said, I'd love to get a copy of that. I said, in fact, I'd like to get maybe five or six copies. Is that possible? She said, yeah, it'll be 45 bucks a piece. I said, what? <laughs> so I paid, you know, whatever I paid, I, 250 or whatever. I don't remember what, how many I bought, but I, I had a buddy that uh, had the digital camera thing, you know, when they stuck, because that wasn't available back then, I don't think. So, uh, but I've sold, sold and signed a lot of those photos, and, and I do consider it a career highlight, so. <laughs> and that's how it came about, so. Yes? Oh, me? Yes, no. sir. Uh, I'm Terry. Hello, Thanks, Terry. Thanks, man. Uh, uh, great to see your bar down on York Street. Thank like you. It, man. Uh, Beer is really cold. good. Bart's on York. Brownies, but, uh, Brownies on York. Bart's on York, yeah. Uh, but the thing about it is, uh, what's your opinion on the pitching today, uh, back in the day, back in the 70s, when we had a team that had four 20-game winners. Well, Baltimore. And I've seen sure. it. I've seen the A's. Baltimore. Baltimore. Well, Billy Martin back Everything. in 81, he let them Everything all pitch like complete that. games. And, and today, if you're lucky to win 10 games, you know, that's well, it. Well, in order to win those games, you got to be out there a little bit longer. You know, I mean, Absolutely. if you, you're going five innings, you still got to face that other lineup for four more innings. I mean, so you've really only right. covered about half of the game, which is, to me, is not enough. Uh, again, I, 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 thankfully, I came up in a general, because I was throwing complete games in the minor leagues and rookie ball. You know, they don't even let them do that now. They didn't let them go more than five or six. I'm like, God, you got to learn to stretch them out. I mean, when I was coaching, uh, I talked to a lot of the uh, pitching coordinators from a lot of teams. I got a coach in the fall league one year, and I had Michael Lorenzen and uh, his first year in. They wanted me to teach him how to be a starter kind of thing. And, uh, but their mindset is totally different. I mean, when after six innings, they're looking into the dugout saying, I'm, I'm, are you going to come and get me? Or, you know? But for me, like I said, every, once every five days, that was my one day to be a player. I got to be in the lineup, you know? So. Uh, I cherished that, and I wanted to be in there for the whole time. I mean, there was nothing greater for a starting pitcher than to be the first guy to shake hands with that catcher. I mean, that was the coolest thing, you know. Uh, that's a sense of accomplishment. That's a, a feather in your cap, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it was something that I really enjoyed, and I wanted to do that every time. Now, like I said, it happened 10% of the time. Uh, but there's a lot of games back then where I went eight innings, and they'd say, hey, this guy hadn't pitched in – three, four days, would you mind letting him finish up? Uh, I went through a stretch in 89 where I had, I had five complete games in a row. Uh, and, I, and that was when, right about when Pete got kicked out in my sixth game. Tommy Helms took over as manager. I'm winning one to nothing and in going into the top of the ninth inning uh, against Pittsburgh. And I get one out and give up a base hit. And, you know, after five in a row, I'm thinking, I'm not coming out of this game, you know. And Tommy came out there and he said, hey, man, you pitched your ass off, you're tired, just give me the ball. So I gave him the ball and I won, I got the win. But uh, no, those guys, those, I mean, I don't know if that's their mindset now or not their mindset. I just don't think we're stressing uh, starters getting us deep into the game. I mean, you watch it, the reason Verlander wins or Reed Scherzinger and all them guys is they're going seven, eight, and nine innings. You know, we can do that. We just, again, we've allowed, I think, uh, statistics. And, and you can, I think you can, Finagle those statistics all you want to make it come out to what you want to to, come, to fit your narrative, uh, but really, there's no measurement on heart or desire or ability to want to do those things. You know, the time of the situation, there's some guys that relish that. You know, other guys are, oh, I hope I don't make a mistake. Oh, there's a three-run homer. Guess what? So, uh, I just think we could get more out of our starters. I would like to see us get more of our starters. And again, I can't fault. Uh, uh, 
pitching coach or the manager uh, too much because they're trying to win every game. They're trying to win every game, and sometimes they think it's best to go get a guy. Uh, but for me, I'd, I'd rather let those guys try to figure out get through that lineup a third time. And if they're able to do that, then well, first of all, if you get a guy that goes seven, eight, or nine innings, the guy that's going behind him is going to want to do the same thing. And then the guy behind him, the same thing. I mean, if you just kind of keep it going, uh, creating a little bit of co uh, uh, competition amongst your, your starters. Uh, and, oh, by the way, we're winning a bunch of games. Uh, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like him to compete, see who can get, you know, go nine. We'll see, you know. Rio and I used to, and Danny Jackson, the three of us used to battle. We always wanted to outdo each other, you know. And in doing that, we all started winning, so. Yes, sir. Tom, this has been great. Thanks for coming out. I'm curious about your opinion on pitchers intentionally hitting batters. Um, it seems... Oops. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. But it seems like the Pirates are getting a lot of flack this year. I don't know if less pitchers are hitting or intentionally, but... Yeah, I'm curious if you could expand on that. Well, I, I, I've noticed that. Uh, I've certainly read some stuff on uh, whatever media outlets there are about the, how aggressive they are inside. Um, they got to do something about it. I mean, I always, you know, there was never a fence there. If you thought I hit you on purpose, you know, come and get me. You know, and then most of the time it, it doesn't happen. You, you hit guys unintentionally, but sometimes you do. Because, uh, well, back then, and I'll say back then like it was so far ago, but not really. Um, the players controlled were in charge. If you hit my guy, I was going to have the opportunity to hit your guy. And then it was over. Usually it was over. But no, not today. Now if you even pitch inside, off the plate, they think you're throwing at them, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but sometimes, you know, maybe they are pitching more aggressively inside. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I've noticed that they have hit a lot of guys, but shoot, Derek, Dietrich's been hit, what, about 20 times already? 22, 23 times? But he's a cocky player. We usually let those guys know we thought they were too cocky. <laughs> Lenny Dykstra, you know, Lenny Dykstra hit a home run off of uh, Mario Soto and admired it. You know, so the next day I pitched, I had the game the next day and the first hitter of the game, I drilled him. You know, was, you know, Bob Gibson. Uh, well, Bob Gibson, he, he, he gonna hit you. And he'll hit you in spring training. So, he'll, so you know during the season, he's not afraid to hit you in, during the regular season, so. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it was, it's, it's, you don't hurt, throw at anybody to, with the intention of hurting them or hitting them. I never threw anybody's head. I always tried to hit them right here because there's not a lot of meat in the ribs. Uh, you know, but he's hit them in the butt or the back or a little bit of the back, uh, that kind of thing. But it's never, you know, I mean, brawls were, were part of the process, but usually the guys that started the brawl, the only ones that didn't get hurt. So I mean, I got stepped on twice, pleated, you know, all that and brawls. Uh, and sometimes that's a nice release. It kind of gets everything, you know, if you're, you're, you're struggling and you get into a, because I always talk about that, you lose a few games, bro, let's just get in a brawl. Start a brawl. <laughs> that's not any fun. Um, but hitting guys, I mean, it's always been part of the game, uh, but it, the umpires now, you know, but if you're told to hit somebody and, and it doesn't, you don't have to be told most of the time, you kind of get the idea that they'd like you to retaliate kind of thing. Don't miss. If a guy hits a home run, and he stands at home plate and watches it land in the river in Pittsburgh. Next time up, I'm going to hit him. I'm not going to throw it behind his head. I'm going to hit him because you know you're going to get thrown out of the game no matter what. Do some damage first, you know. Get your guy. I mean that's that's the way I look at it. I remember Sean Estes, uh, pitcher for the Pirate or uh, for the San Francisco Giants, was told to drill Roger Clemens, and Roger Clemens was a head hunter. Roger Clemens hit guys. Here's your one chance to get back for all of mankind in baseball that he has hit. And he throws four pitches not even close. You know, that's why I said the problem with these guys is hit them. You don't have to throw it as hard as you can, but you've got to throw it where you want to throw it. Uh, but I think that get, gets lost in it, you know. And, and, and you, have to pitch, you have to pitch inside just to keep them honest. Because if you're going to let them dive out on a plate and hit that, Fastball with the launch angle and all that stuff, you know, you're going to give up some home runs. So if you can't keep them off the plate by pitching inside, and when I mean pitch inside, I either throw it, try to throw it for a strike on the on the corner, or miss a little bit in if I missed. I never, when I missed out over the plate, they hit a home run. So uh, it, it, it was necessary to, to command both sides of that plate. I did a card show going way back 
with Jim Palmer, Tom Seaver, Bob Gibson, maybe Fergie Jenkins, I don't remember who it was. But there was four guys wearing this back room signing some stuff for the dealers. And they're just sitting around bullshitting and they said, hey Tom, you wanna come and join? I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I sat there for a little bit and then I finally said, let me ask you, uh, if there was one pitcher you could throw in your sleep, what would it be? And he said, that low and away fastball. I said, yeah. You know, we don't do that. We don't even practice that. We go out there and throw 30 pitches and see how hard we can throw it, and maybe throw a few strikes, but really cut loose and, and get nothing out of it. You know? I said, the hitter will tell you what kind of stuff you got. Don't worry about what that radar gun says, whatever else. You go out there with what your stuff and let the hitter tell you how good of stuff you got. You know, if you throw it in some good quality places, you're probably gonna get some outs. If you throw it down the middle, they're probably gonna whack you. All right, but don't be afraid to make mistakes because you're gonna make them anyway. Just go out there and be aggressive. Be aggressive. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, come, come game day, did you have any weird superstition or if not, <laughs> uh, share a teammate's bizarre superstition, maybe? Uh, I, we were a sensitive, superstitious lot. Uh, yes, uh, my hat and glove were always on my right hand side, okay, in the, in the dugout. And if I got up to hit or whatever else and I came in and somebody was in my seat, I stood there and stared at you until you got out. Uh, in September was tough because you had to call ups and then the bench, you know, was always full. So uh, I always clip my nails at 6.15. If it was a 735 game, I went in the training room and clipped my nails. Uh, I drank iced tea. I went to, I always stopped at Frisch's on 3L Highway and bought two 32 ounce uh, iced teas. Uh, took them back and I had a Gatorade bottle, the MMM Green Gatorade squirt bottles. I would fill that up with half of ice and I would fill that up with uh, tea and I would jam it in the ice machine and, and the trainer would always bring it out for the game. And then I always had, I had my other one that I had in my locker that I, uh, because they said it had more caffeine than coffee. So, uh, and I peed every, <laughs> five minutes <laughs> and when the game started I didn't ever have to pee again you know and I just been I kept drinking the iced tea uh, I never stepped on the white line I learned that from Sparky Anderson uh, I watched him as a, as a manager in the 70s he always hopped over that right the foul line so I did that uh, I never stepped on it because that was kind of sacred hollow, gr hollow ground um, just a few things, you know, I, I, but uh, just once the game started, you know, I never, uh, yeah, I just did, just the things I, I was just, I, and I was probably more anal about a lot of things. I mean, I, I remember the day of my perfect game, I had watermelon, actually my wife woke me up at nine o'clock morning and said, hey, are you gonna clean the garage today? I said, well, I'm pitching today. And she said, well, maybe you would pitch better if you got your ass out of bed and did something around the house. Uh, so at noon, I'm cutting up watermelon, and she comes in and after me again, and I said, you know what, I think I'm done. I think I'm going to the ballpark. So I went down there and stopped at Frisch's, got my iced teas, and on, the, on that perfect game night, it was raining. It rained all day, uh, but I was at the clubhouse, and it was a lot quieter there, so. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think every pitcher has superstitions. Some of them, you know, more than that, like Wade Boggs, they checking every day, and whatever. Uh, you know, them, but that's who we are. If it works, I can tell you, I had watermelon every start after that, uh, just because I thought it uh, brought me, uh, gave me some good luck or something. But um, there are not very many, but there are a few, you know. Did you see Mike Leake took a perfect game in the ninth inning last night? Yeah, I mean, that'd be really good to go all nine. <laughs> but I was happy for him. I always liked Mike Leake, because Mike Leake worked quick, he got you deep into the game. You know, and that's, again, that's... Uh, he never went to a three-ball count either. Oh, is that right? That's what I read. Oh, I, don't, I, I didn't get to see. I, I was at the bar watching it. My wife wanted to go home, so I said, well, we'll listen to it on the radio on the way home. And couldn't listen to it on the radio. You I didn't go to a three ball game. I did not, no. No. So, anything else? Yeah, Tom, I was, at first I want to thank you. I appreciate your candor in answering questions. Um, I want to talk about the perfect game and the relationship with the catcher and um, with Reed and, like, the rhythm you get into and how maybe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but was it different from other games? Was the rhythm different? Were you calling off less pitches? Or how, how did, how did the, as the game went on, that sort of relationship with the catcher evolved during that game? Okay, um, 
Yes, uh, Reedy, of course, I, I, I didn't care who caught me, you know, I was gonna call my game. I hope that you understood that and you put down, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Cause that L don't go behind your name, it goes behind my name. So I was gonna take responsibility for everything. Uh, I, I had a good rapport with Reedy, uh, as well as Joe. You know, I got into a couple things, you know, Pete actually told Jeff Reed, hey, every now and then stand up and slow him down. Cause he likes to work too quick. He says, sometimes he likes to throw that ball right down the middle. Well, I don't like to throw it right down the middle. Sometimes it ended up there, but, uh, but I, and I remember him standing up, you know, I'm getting ready to pitch and he just kind of stands up and just kind of, you know, whatever. And then he gets down there. Uh, but I had a good rapport with him. I, you know, he knew what I wanted to throw, but I, I wasn't a shaker per se, unless I wanted him to see me shake, the hitter to see me shake. But I would just stare until I saw, I only had two pitches, fastball or change up. You know, when I give up a home run, I threw a breaking ball, because uh, it was terrible. I had the same breaking ball in high school as I did in major leagues. I just never made it better or got it better because I didn't want to lose my fastball change up combination. Uh, but no, I was uh, Reedy, you know, he knew what I liked to do. He liked, uh, I liked to start away and then uh, I'd like to finish him up in. Uh, and sometimes the other way around, like Kirk Gibson, I always pitched him in and then pitched him away uh, once I got ahead. Um, but they all, you know, it was easy for me. It was easy to follow me or catch me because I didn't have a, you know, a, a variety of pitches. I didn't really, you know, I only want, I like two spots, low and way and up and in. You know, if I had a, like a little second baseman or something, I could pitch him away and he could hit a fly ball on my right fielder if he wanted to. So, uh, but nowadays that ball, they're, they're hitting it in the seats because um, the balls are so hard. But we had, you know, I had a good, Rapport. I had good rhythm, you know. I mean, I had people ask, "Did you know anything?" I said, "No. Nah, I treated my bullpens all the same. Just when I got to the mound, I want to make sure I had command of that fastball, you know. And the other stuff I would use eventually. But, you know, to be honest, the first time around the lineup, I always tried to stay with nothing but fastballs, you know. Just if I just put them in some spots, and because uh, I—that's how much I trusted my fastball. But um, we had good rhythm there, you know. And I do, like I said, I, I, it took me probably maybe about 10 years after the fact before I saw the video, you know. Um, and I saw Reedy standing up and I said, I'll be a son of a gun. He did, he was trying to slow me down. Uh, which it worked, I mean, obviously, I didn't, uh, didn't go up any hits or anything, so. Uh, but that, that is probably the most uh, important role for a catcher, is to have a good rapport with his pitchers, you know. Uh, did you talk about your friends? Oh, hell no, you got no friends during that. Uh, well, I mean, I wasn't a big gabber, you know. I just kind of sat in the dugout and cooled off, waited for my, you know. The thing, the good thing about that game is that Timmy Belcher took a no-hitter with me into two outs into the sixth inning as well. So those first five innings probably took 40 minutes, maybe, at the most. I mean, it went by really quick, and uh, and that's what I liked it. I liked to go quick and, and force him to get his ass back out there, and he does the same, and next thing you know, you're in the seventh and eighth inning, and it's a, and it's a good ball game. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's different now because now these catchers are getting getting so much information that, you know, uh, I remember Bo Diaz, who was probably my favorite catcher I ever had. He used to look at me and say, come on, and he'd just give me a target. He knew what I was throwing. He'd just take, look. He wouldn't even give me a sign. He'd just say, come on, throw it. And then, uh, and those are the kind of guys, you know, they have enough confidence. But again, I didn't have a whole lot of, I didn't have a repertoire. I didn't have nasty stuff. I had a nice changeup or a screwball. I had a, you know, like I said, a fastball that I could command. Uh, but I made mistakes. Hell, I gave up 200 and something home runs. I wanted to give up 400. Because you've got to stay around a long time to give up 400. Uh, I know Robin Roberts gave up 400. And I said, oh, that's one of my goals. You know, obviously Warren Spahn won 363 games. I wanted to kind of get to that. And I didn't even get a third of the way. Uh, about a third of the way, I guess. Um, but those are the kind of goals I had. You know, I wanted to lead the league in starts. I always wanted to lead the league in innings pitched. Uh, Wins would have been nice, but you know, it's hard to do that all the time. So, but I, I mean, I, my, my job was to be one of the five guys that they could rely on starting a game and giving them an opportunity to win. You know, I didn't need to be the first guy, the second guy, third guy, fourth guy, I didn't care. Because that day, you're the ace of that team anyway. Uh, my job was to, to give them, get them as deep of the game as I could with the opportunity to win. You know, and, and I, like I said, I cherished complete games. I look, I, there was nothing that made me more proud than to throw, go nine innings and win, obviously. So, yes, sir. Yes, what about those long hair that the guys wearing the jewelry? You know, the beards and long hair. What's the purpose of that? 
the Mr. T starter set. <laughs> uh, it's making its way back. Uh, you know, there's a lot of gold being flung around there, and you know, I think they banned it for a while. I don't. I think they made him take all the gold off uh, for the games. You know, now it's I guess part of their repertoire, part of their uh, uniform. You know, they get to wear whatever shoes they want now, whatever color shoes they want. You know, we had we were all black, and then we went to red. Uh, no facial hair, uh, which I thought was awesome. Uh, but then I think it was Greg Vaughn came in in uh, late 90s. Uh, he came over and wanted to wear a beard, and Marge said, I really can't stop this. So then that's when the beards came. And now they're, they're lumberjacks. Now they're wearing this. They're, I think they're hiding food in there. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's just, you know, it's funny how things evolve and how, how they come back in, in, in vogue again. You know, the, I did notice that the chains are now starting to reappear. Uh, and the beards and the long hair. I, I'm, I'm probably going to say I probably would have joined that because I love growing a beard. I love not shaving. Uh, but it's a little ratty now. Some of them need to shut, uh, shave it off because it don't look that good. But um, I guess you can do whatever you want now as long as you uh, hit home runs and strike people out. Yes, sir. You said you uh, learned to pitch real fast by watching uh, uh, fast pitch softball? Yes, my, my dad, my uncles. I actually watched my grandma break up a fight between my dad and my uncle out on, on the mound one game. Uh, but yeah, they, I, I, you know, and, and they used to get it and go. And I didn't realize that they had a time limit. So they didn't waste much time. They'd throw three or four pitches and they'd play the game, you know. And I, my first year in Little League, my first year of uh, playing ball in eighth grade, or uh, as an eight year old, I had coaches telling their kids to step out of me to slow me down, you know, and I just emulated what I saw my dad and my uncles do, you know. We played, we went softball tournaments, they played five games in a, in a day, I mean, God, it was awesome, you know. We, we didn't have any responsibility, we could sneak away or whatever uh, back then, you know, I mean, get in trouble with, so. Uh, but that's where I learned, to work quick, you know, uh, and I did that my whole career. Coaches ever try to slow you down? Not really, no. Uh, Shoot, they like them quick games too. We always picked a Browning game to go to because of that reason. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was good for two hours, so I had to hurry up and get it over with, so. <laughs> but that's where I learned to pitch quick, so. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, uh, I'm Terry again. Hi, Terry. <laughs> Welcome uh, back. Uh, I just come up, man, and, I, and I'm from the old, the old school. Uh, how was it like playing under Pete Rose as a manager. Well, when he first when I first played for him, he was still playing. Uh, he couldn't have a conversation with us. He couldn't walk towards the mound to have a conversation with us because it would count as a as a trip to the mound. So we pitchers knowing that when he looked like he was kind of taking a step towards us to talk, we just kind of turn our back away from him. And, uh, and ignore him, but he was awesome. Um, you know, we had George Scherger, he was our bench coach. Love Scherger. Uh, he had some baseball people around him. He had Tommy Helms and Doggy, you know, so, uh, so he had some people to help him figure out how to run the game or, or allow Scherger to do a lot of that and just tell people what he thought needed to be done and that kind of thing. But. Uh, like I said, when you showed up to the ballpark playing under Pete Rose, all you did was you, you be on time and you play hard. And that's it, you know. Uh, it made it real easy, you know. Of course, uh, Eric and I came up, Paul O'Neill and I, uh, we all kind of came up together in the organization. So uh, Pete was probably uh, responsible for the rearing of all of us young guys that Lou Pinella inherited. Kind of like Dave Bristol was for, Sparky did what Dave Bristol put together. Uh, and Sparky ran, uh, got the benefits, you know. And I think the same thing with Lou, although Lou didn't need anybody to help him. He, he was, you know, but by the time Lou got here, we were pretty polished players and we were just needed that extra whatever. But playing for Pete was awesome. Uh, he let me steal bases. He let me pinch run. I mean, it was awesome. You know, because there was always a rule if you got, uh, if I, if I get on first base and there's two outs, I, w I had the green light. I could steal any time I wanted to because if I got thrown out, the leadoff hitter was leading off the next inning anyway. So uh, that was the cool thing about it. You know, I, I will say this. Um, 
Pete got kicked out in 1989. Uh, during the winter, they hired Lou Pinella to be the manager for the 90 team. Uh, we had been locked out of spring training, but a lot of us were down there. We were working out at Plant City High School, throwing batting practice, whatever. Uh, and Pete was living down there, and he had taken up the game of golf. And he asked me to play golf with him. So I had a buddy of mine, Jeff Henry, from here, one of my dear friends, uh, and, and I, and Pete, and this guy named Steve Cunningham, who became friends uh, until he passed uh, from South Carolina. So we're playing at Walden Lakes out, out there in Plant City, and in the eighth hole, the tee box is recessed with these palmetto bushes. You can see the front of the tee, but you can't see any, and you can't see the tee box from the road. And this, and this hole is right along the road. So my buddy and Jeff and I are standing on the front of the tee box waiting for the, the group to clear out of the fairway. And Lou Pinella comes by in his Cadillac and he stops and he sees me. And he sees me and he stops and he, and he walks up to the tee box. And he said, hey Tom, Lou Pinella. I said, hey Lou, this is my buddy Jeff Henry. And about that time he turns around and looks and there's Pete. I wanted to be anywhere else but there. Uh, but in true Lou fashion, Lou said, hey Pete, Nice to see you. He said, maybe I can sit down with you sometime and talk to you about your team. And kind of diffuse the whole situation. So uh, I couldn't have played for two better guys, you know. I think we could take maybe one, maybe two questions. Tom will be around afterwards if you guys want to have questions. Yeah, I'm taking my grandkids to the game, so I'm not in a hurry to go get them. <laughs> Thanks for coming out, Tom. Really enjoyed it. I read in one of the blogs this week where uh, it said the Yankees have enough to make a run at uh, Luis Castillo. What would your thoughts be on that? That would suck. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure. You know, I don't know. You know, we used to have these. Uh, the, the, what were they called? It the uh, crown jewels. You know, Eric and Cal and Paul and Tracy Jones. Uh, and they all left. Um, gosh, I hope not. I mean, he's the, he's the kind of guy you can build a, 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 a rotation or a staff around. Um, but he came from what well, he came from the Marlins. So I mean, I, I hope not. I think he's finally just kind of coming into his own. He's probably getting ready to make a lot of money. But I, you know, I I, I also look at him as a kid who's very humble uh, and enjoys success, but is not too overwhelmed by it. And he just expects to go out there and win. Um, but I'm going to say I hope that does not happen. So um, I didn't read that, but you know I don't know if any, everybody's untouchable. Or my my phone's buzzing, so there's nobody I know. Um, I, I hope, would hope not. I would hope that we were, you know. But if they shoot, they got Didi Gregorius from us. Uh, well, they didn't get him. They got him through Arizona. But uh, I coached Didi in the minor leagues. And we had him in rookie ball, I had him in rookie ball, and we were in Sarasota. And the Sarasota Reds, the high eight team was there, and their shortstop got hurt, so we let him borrow Didi for a week. And at the end of the week, he was the number one rated shortstop in the Florida State League, and he still left and went to Billings. So, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to see us lose. You no, know, we got some guys coming, you know, but we're not, we're, we're, we need to be done with the rebuilding and all that. You know, we need to start uh, stockpiling. You know, get a bunch of guys down there. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I have a son that plays for the Boston Red Sox. He's in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, he's a left-handed pitcher. He's their closer. Uh, but their, their whole bullpen is nothing but lefties. They got all lefties in the bullpen. I'm like, man, they could trade. They got all sorts of things to do, you know. I mean, they got so many avenues to travel because they got all left-handers. But I also know that if you want to get fired as a manager, uh, It'll be a left-hand reliever that gets you fired. <laughs> but uh, I hope I hope he stays. I hope he lock they lock him up for a while. You know, that would that would really suck. All right, I'm done. I'm done. All right, thank you, Tom. Tom Brown.